On the 11th of March 2011, a series of events all triggered by the devastating Tohoku earthquake in Japan led to one of the worst nuclear accidents the world has ever seen. In the aftermath of the catastrophic meltdown and subsequent explosions, hundreds of thousands of people were evacuated, with the site of the plant itself still rendered uninhabitable up to this very day. In this video, we'll be taking a deeper dive into the events leading up to the Fukushima nuclear disaster, what went wrong, and what is being done today to prevent disasters of this magnitude from ever happening again. After the Second World War, Japan experienced what could only be described as an economic miracle. Despite the devastating loss in lives and infrastructure that they suffered at the end of the war, the Japanese economy and population saw an unprecedented growth over the next 20 years. With this growth came an ever-increasing demand for power and electricity in order to sustain this developing nation. And so, in 1955, with some intervention from the United States, the Atomic Energy Basic Law was passed, outlining the basics for the use of nuclear power in the country and marking the beginning of Japan's era of nuclear energy. Located in the small coastal town of Okuma, the Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Power Plant is one of the many nuclear facilities built during the 60s as a result of Japan's push to develop its nuclear energy sector. With a total power generating capacity of 4.7 gigawatts across its six reactors, Fukushima Daiichi is the second most powerful nuclear facility in Japan, behind only the Kashiwazaki Kariwa, the world's largest and most powerful. The plant provides power to the neighboring regions of Miyagi, Tochigi, Ibaraki, and even the capital, Tokyo. Being located at the convergence of four tectonic plates, Japan is one of the most seismically active countries in the world and is prone to both destructive earthquakes and tsunamis. An earthquake so strong it literally shifted the Earth's axis by about 25 centimeters. Because of this, the country is one of the strictest and most rigorous when it comes to earthquake building standards. So, when Fukushima Daiichi was being built, its owner and operator, Tokyo Electric Power Company, or TEPCO, had to make sure that the plant was up to the latest standards when it comes to safety precautions and equipment. TEPCO, at the time of construction in the late 1960s, deemed the site to be safe from tsunamis because of a 6-meter seawall that was constructed to safeguard the facility. However, just mere days before the earthquake, TEPCO submitted a report to Japan's Nuclear Safety Agency, which detailed the possibility of the nuclear power plant being easily vulnerable to a similar earthquake that struck the area back in 1896. According to the report, a 7.2 magnitude earthquake could create tsunamis that would be almost twice the height of the plant's current protective seawall. If this were ever to happen, the consequences could be extremely serious. In an event that could only be described as a terrible twist of fate, just four days later, on March 11, 2011, disaster struck. At exactly 2.46 p.m., just over 70 kilometers off the eastern coast of the Japanese archipelago, the Pacific Plate subducted below the Okhotsk Plate and triggered a magnitude 9.1 earthquake that sent shockwaves under the ocean. Commonly known as the 2011 Tohoku earthquake, this event is widely regarded as the most powerful and most destructive earthquake in Japan's recorded history and the sixth largest earthquake in the world by magnitude. It was reported that waves as high as 40 meters were generated by the powerful tremors. To put it into perspective, these massive waves would have been as tall as a 12-story building. The tsunami traveled as fast as 700 kilometers per hour and reached up to 10 kilometers inland in some areas. In the span of just a few hours after the earthquake struck, a combined total of more than 1 million buildings and structures were either destroyed or partially damaged by the disaster. But for the people living in the surrounding areas of the Fukushima nuclear power plant, the worst was still yet to come. 2.46 p.m., just mere seconds after the first shockwaves and signs of shaking were felt at Fukushima Daiichi, reactors 1, 2, and 3 were all automatically shut down. Reactors 4, 5, and 6, on the other hand, were all undergoing maintenance at the time and were not operational. Fortunately, this meant that the fuel rods in Reactor 4 had already been removed and placed in what is called a spent fuel pool, where nuclear power plants such as this one store their spent fuel. However, this spent fuel pool later proved to become a serious problem. 
the strength of the tremors cut the entire power plant off from the electricity grid, but safety precautions were in place exactly for this kind of situation. Backup generators immediately kicked in, which were responsible for continuously cooling the reactors by circulating water, even in the event of a power disruption such as this one. Without this constant flow of coolant, the reactors would be in danger of a catastrophic nuclear meltdown. 3.27 p.m. The first tsunami strikes the facility's protective seawall. This first wave was completely absorbed by the seawall and successfully protected the power plant from severe flooding. 3.46 p.m. A 14-meter tsunami, more than double the height of the facility's seawall, strikes the power plant, just exactly as how it was reported by TEPCO four days ago in their report. The tsunami immediately floods the entire power plant, submerging all but one of the facility's backup diesel generators, which were all located underground, rendering them inoperable. With this loss of power to the entire facilities, all of the safety systems ran by the electricity immediately shut down. Temperatures soon started to rise inside of the reactors as the plant's employees scrambled to resolve the crisis. If they fail to restore power to the reactors, a meltdown will be inevitable. 6 p.m. Water levels inside of Reactor 1 have fallen to critically low levels, exposing the top of the nuclear fuel rods to the air. Without enough water for cooling, the temperature of the core reactor starts to increase. An hour later, Japanese Prime Minister Nao Khan declares a nuclear emergency. Government officials reassure the public that the declaration was only a necessary precaution, stating that no radiation has been detected and proper procedures are currently being undertaken to resolve the problem. 30 minutes after the declaration, the radioactive fuel inside of Reactor 1 is now fully exposed to the air. Without any water for the heat to radiate through, the fuel rods continue to heat up, and eventually the fuel reaches its own melting point. Nuclear meltdown had just begun. 9 p.m. With fears of a catastrophic explosion similar to that of the Chernobyl accident, a mandatory evacuation order is issued by the government to all people within a 3-kilometer radius of the plant. Those within 10 kilometers, on the other hand, were allowed to stay but were advised to prepare for an evacuation nonetheless. The next day, 5.30 a.m. With temperatures and pressure building up inside of Reactor 1 over the night, officials decide to vent out steam from the reactor, releasing for the very first time small amounts of radiation into the air. 3.30 p.m. The mandatory evacuation radius is extended to all people within 10 kilometers of Fukushima Daiichi. Just six minutes later, a massive hydrogen explosion rocks the building of Reactor 1. Five plant workers were injured by the explosion, Later that day, the mandatory evacuation zone had been extended to 20 kilometers. The coolant injection system for Reactor 3 also fails. The water level inside of the reactor starts to decrease as it slowly boils away due to excess heat. By 7 a.m., the top of the fuel rods inside of Reactor 3 are now also directly exposed to the air as water levels continue to plummet. Two hours later, the fuel rods begin to melt due to extreme temperatures. Another reactor core is now dangerously close to a catastrophic explosion. March 14, 1101 AM. Due to the excessive buildup of pressure and hydrogen gas inside of Reactor 3, another explosion rocks the facility, leading to the collapse of the Reactor 3 building. 11 workers were injured in the explosion, and vital pipes that carried water going to Reactor 2 were damaged. 1.15 p.m. Reactor 2's cooling system fails and water levels start to decrease, just as it had happened with Reactor 1 and 3 before. By 6 a.m. the next day, a third explosion damages an area above the reactor and the spent fuel pool of Reactor 4. A fire later breaks out at the same location, leading to dangerous levels of radiation being released into the surrounding environment. Throughout the rest of the day, seawater is constantly pumped into Units 1, 2, and 3 in order to hopefully stabilize the core's temperatures. It is also worth noting that, as TEPCO and government officials scrambled to contain the situation at Fukushima Daiichi, the rest of Japan was still fighting the aftermath of the earthquake and tsunami. Vital infrastructure, such as roads and bridges, were completely destroyed, slowing down the rescue and relief operations. Finally, on March 20th, nine days after the earthquake, replacement diesel generators were brought to reactors 4 and 5, which by the next day were finally brought to a cold shutdown.
However, despite these positive developments, the damage to the surrounding land and waters had already been done. For one, the venting of the reactors during the incident released substantial amounts of radioactive material. It was also later revealed by TEPCO in 2013 that contaminated groundwater had constantly been leaking into the Pacific Ocean ever since the accident. A 2013 WHO report also stated that a certain subset of populations living inside the Fukushima prefecture had a substantially higher chance of developing thyroid cancer in their lifetime compared to people who were living in other areas. Up to this very day, more than 200 square kilometers of land surrounding the Fukushima Daiichi is considered a nuclear exclusion zone, wherein civilians are restricted access because of dangerous levels of radiation. Today, 12 years after the accident, much work is still being done in order to clean up and limit radioactive contamination within Fukushima Daiichi. It is estimated that the decommissioning of the plant could cost tens of billions of dollars and last for another 30 or 40 years. One of the most important parts of the Fukushima disaster cleanup is the removal of spent nuclear fuel from the reactor cores. As of 2021, all spent fuel from reactors 3 and 4 have successfully been removed. Operations to remove the spent fuel assemblies from reactors 2 and 1 are expected to begin in the fall of 2023 and 2027, respectively. Reactors 5 and 6, meanwhile, suffered no major damage and had successfully been shut down since 2011. A few months after the disaster, TEPCO installed radioactive water treatment systems that were capable of decontaminating the radioactive water from the site. Although, despite their efforts, the nuclear plant has accumulated too much wastewater, which they no longer had any more room to store. So, in April 2021, to the general public's dismay, it was finally approved by the Japanese government for TEPCO to dump water into the Pacific Ocean over the course of 30 years. Some experts believe that this move could have long-term consequences, not just to marine life, but also to the local fishing industry in the area. The Japanese cabinet asserted that the dumped water will eventually be diluted by the ocean. The Fukushima nuclear disaster revealed many nuclear safety lessons that are now implemented not just in Japan, but also in the rest of the world. For one, vital emergency systems that do not require electricity to operate are now in place in many nuclear reactors. It has also become an industry standard to have an ample supply of backup batteries in case of power outages. Backup diesel generator rooms are now required to be watertight and blast resistant. What do you think about Japan's response to the Fukushima disaster? What do you think they could have done better? Let us know in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.